we'll be in chapter 4 today. Um, you can certainly pray for us. We will get through the whole chapter today, and I hope to do so in, you know, less than three hours. So uh, we're going to study our book, uh, 1 Corinthians, this week and next. Uh, realistically, I could break this chapter down into probably at least three sermons, but we would likely, given the rest of what's coming, be in 1 Corinthians until 2029 or so. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I wanted to tackle the entire chapter this morning. So um, would you jump into 1 Corinthians 4 with me, verses 1 through 21. Let's read. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Uh, the, that word is also faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, I do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation, not condemnation, commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you would have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For, through you, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became a father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you, if the Lord wills, and I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with, a, with love in a spirit of gentleness? This is the word of the Lord. Before we begin our time this morning, would you pray with me very briefly? Father, I ask that you would go before us this morning. Lord, I ask that by the Spirit of God, you'd use the Word of God to reveal to us the Son of God, all for the glory of God. We ask this in the matchless and magnificent name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, have you ever played a game of Whisper Down the Lane? Or telephone, right? That old game where like someone whispers something into the first person's ear and then that phrase has to travel through the whole group and that last person has to repeat it for the person who said it to find out really how close they got. And it's usually like wildly off, really often hilarious. It's where the phrase purple monkey dishwasher generally tends to f come from. Although that was technically a Simpsons episode. Kids don't watch the Simpsons. Um, I digress. It's often used by teachers to talk about areas of gossip. It's often used by pastors uh, to, almost as an object lesson, like point out the hilariousness of what happens when people get the story wrong, right? The reality is at any given point in a church like this, there are many of you that are probably playing Whisper Down the Lane right now. But sometimes the reality is we can give a set of instructions, we can hope that they have a really good outcome. But often, those sets of instructions are taken in a very, very different way than they were intended. I think 
that's a little bit of what's going on as we jump into 1 Corinthians 4 today. If you've been in our study, you know that the problem of the Corinthian church is namely what? What's their main problem? Pride, maybe? What's the main thing he keeps coming after? It's a D word. Division, right? Division. They're divided over teachers. They're divided over preachers. They're divided against one another. And they're boasting. They're prideful. So certainly pride is there. But ultimately, he keeps coming back to division. Because the believers are finding and accruing for themselves different leaders and kind of building factions, right? One saying, I follow Paul. Another saying, I follow Apollos or I follow Peter. Some are saying, I follow Christ. So there's different camps that are forming within the church and they're kind of rallying around these individual leaders. Paul's spending the first three of our four chapters trying to conv convince them or correct them and rebuke them a little bit for this error. And the consistent thread is this. It's your division undercuts the very logic of the gospel. Because what you're trying to do in these different ways is find that people are sufficient, or they're greater than, or they're the ones that are going to rescue. They're the ones that are going to make this church successful or make the kingdom advance. So you're trying to find these different leaders to identify yourself with and gain a little cachet with, to make yourself feel better and maybe get a sense of importance. And Paul's going to say over and over, you need to understand that the gospel doesn't work that way. The gospel is actually a message about a crucified Savior. It's a message of foolishness, right? It's a message of how God becomes man. And instead of coming and destroying all his enemies, like the people of the day had hoped, instead of deposing the Romans, instead of getting, shucking off this authority and, and establishing a political reign, that's not what Jesus does. He comes as a servant, right, who lays down his life for their sins so that he can rescue his enemies. That's the message of the gospel. It flips human reason and wisdom on its head and it comes to those who are ready to receive it as this incredible wisdom from God. But to the natural person, as we learned, who doesn't have the Spirit of God, who's not ready to receive it, that just sounds crazy. Right? The world's way of thinking is obviously there's a way for us to win, and that's to find the right leaders, to build the right kind of tribe, to get the right strategy and run with it. Right? And and what he's saying you're doing by building these factions, Corinthians, is it's an anti-gospel way of going about this whole church thing. So over and over, he's going to try to show them that their division is contrary to the message of the gospel. And if you're not a Christian this morning, please know that what we want at Hilltown Baptist Church is for you to hear the gospel loud and clear today. It's not that this group of people here are a group that have it all together, right? Right? I, you have it all together. I definitely don't have it all together. You guys are wonderful. We're not a group of people that have it all together, right? That's not the gospel. The message of the gospel that this church has believed and received is that we could not save ourselves, but instead a loving and holy God has done everything for us. He's the one who could rescue us, who came to rescue us. That's what we're celebrating we're not here to self-promote. He's the one who accomplished what we could not. We're not here to build tribes. What we're here to do, week in and week out, is worship God together in spirit and in truth. Because only God is worthy of our worship. So what's happening in the Corinthian church is always also a danger for us. That we can almost and very easily forget the beauty of that gospel. Instead, try to take not only our salvation, but the work of the ministry and the success of its ministry in our own hands. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul breaks that principle down. He says, you think way too much of yourselves, way too much of your leaders. And he makes a really concerted effort to take their leaders down a notch. Right? When he says, I follow Paul or I follow Paulus, Paul asks the question, like, who is Paul? All right, who is Apollos? And he identifies them first and foremost as servants of God. Not the ones who do the work, not the ones who get the work done. That's right out of the gate in verse 1. God is the one who gets it done. These leaders are instruments in God's hands. What I think is going on 
in chapter 4 as we get into this because he's dealt with all this division leading up to it. Is that Paul's anticipating their misapplication of that. He's anticipating that they're going to say, well, if it's not our leaders and they're not that big of a deal, we can kind of do whatever we want and choose who we want to listen to. So then Paul has to recognize, no, 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 don't misunderstand. There is a place for godly, cross-centered, gospel-shaped ministry. So don't disregard it. Because these Corinthians are still inclined to believe and lean towards worldly wisdom. They're still inclined to lean towards worldly wisdom instead of spiritual wisdom. And the reality also is that when Paul is weighed up against these kinds of really great orators of the day, these people that can philosophize their way in and around and up and upside down any question, right? The sort of like, is, can God create a rock so big he can't lift it? Those kinds of things, those kinds of discussions. He's guarding against his ministry being discarded. He's not guarding against his ministry for his own sake. He's trying to protect his ministry because Paul's ministry is the one that looks like the cross, That we preach. It's the one that looks like the gospel that we proclaim. He's saying this gospel ministry is actually for you and for it looks like Christ, he says. So, what he's gonna do is try to explain to the Corinthians in chapter four the proper role of gospel ministry. He's gonna show them what true gospel ministry is and what it ought to look like in their lives. So what I'm hoping to do this morning is to walk through this text together, and we're going to identify three features of true gospel ministry. It's a ministry that looks like the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way that Paul serves God for the good of the Corinthian Christians. We're going to identify three features of true gospel ministry. So Paul says, because my ministry looks like this, This is how you should respond. So when we identify each of these features, you should hopefully be asking yourself, how is it that I can similarly live out this kind of Christ-centered life? Some texts, it's really easy to sort of lead people to it and sort of do the whole horse-to-water thing. Other times, I feel like it's kind of an assault on everyone's own logic and sensibility. Like, you don't have to then, like, force someone to it and sort of dunk their head in and say, this is how you must do this, I really want to leave that up to you, specifically in your own lives. But I want to point some things out. So let's go through the text and identify these features. They're going to come in sets of two. So there will be three sets of two. The first mark of gospel ministry is that it's composed of servants and stewards. Okay? True gospel ministry is composed of servants and stewards. Verse 1 says this, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You have here two metaphors that are getting at the essence of godly leadership. He calls himself a servant of Christ, which he's already done in chapter 3. But then he also introduces this idea of stewardship of the mysteries of God. And he really focuses on the verses following on that stewardship because it gets at this idea of accountability. If you're not familiar with the idea of what a steward is, the implication there is that it's someone who's in authority, who entrusts somebody else with a responsibility to take whatever's given to them and use it faithfully. If you're familiar with the Bible, you might remember that the story of the five talents is there. Some of the servants uh, get five talents, some get three, some get one, but the master basically says, here are some, here's some money to use. Go and use it. Be faithful, be wise stewards of it. So some get different amounts. But the thing that they're judged on is not whether or not they have more or less. They're judged on whether they're faithful with what they've received. So much so that when the master comes back, he's not interested necessarily in the quantity. He's interested in, did you steward my resources well? Did you use it for the purposes I gave to you? Paul here is recognizing that he is a steward of the mysteries of God. As an apostle, he's received from God a stewardship. He's a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he knows that as a steward, he has received something and he will be judged. That's exactly what he says in verse 2. 
And it requires, it's required of stewards that what? That they be found faithful. There's one feature of every steward. Faithfulness. Right? You can take 1 Timothy 3. Clear qualifications of elders and deacons. You can look at Titus 1. But don't forget to look at Corinthians 4. Servants of Christ, these stewards of the church, they're going to be asked, were you faithful with what was entrusted to you? Even, even as Paul talked in the last chapter about looking forward to that day when the fires of judgment or the flames of purging will test our works, it's looking towards that day of sort of, will you be found faithful? So Paul's saying, I know I'm going to be assessed for whether or not I'm faithful. I know there's accountability, but who gets to decide whether you're faithful or whether I'm faithful? Paul knows he's not actually accountable to the Corinthians. Look at what he says in verse 3. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. This is one of the reasons that my ministry doesn't look like all this impressive stuff that you want, Corinthians, all this amazing rhetorical twirling, twisting, and hula hooping, is because I'm not responsible to you and to make you feel great about it. I'm ultimately responsible first and foremost to Christ. And that's who will judge my work. I'm not here to be judged by you or whether or not you like this ministry. I'm here to be judged by the one who sent me, says Paul. Notice he goes even further to say that he's not even necessarily here trying to satisfy himself. There's almost this implication that like even in ministry, there's, there's this idea. And if, if you've ever been in ministry or if you ever have aspirations of ministry, know that there's this insidious little desire that happens where you almost want to justify yourself. It's really easy to kind of believe your own press and to find that somehow, in some way, there's, you're, you're somehow doing it for yourself and not for the one who you're responsible to. But he says, I don't even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself. It's possible that it's just sufficient for Paul to minister with a good conscience. But he says, I'm glad I have a clear conscience. I'm not aware of anything against myself. I don't feel guilty about how I'm going about this. But that's not the point. He actually lands it at, it's the Lord who judges. He says that his stewardship, Paul's stewardship, and his responsibility is ultimately to the Lord. It's this laser-like focus, pouring himself out to please the one who gave him the task. It's exactly the same language that Paul uses when he talks to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2. He gives Timothy a number of iterations of what the pastor is supposed to look like. Right? He tells him you have to, it's kind of like an athlete, you have to run with rules and according to a set goal. And then he says, being a pastor is kind of like a farmer, you have to work hard. Then he says, a third analogy, a pastor is kind of like a soldier, and if you're a soldier, you have one goal. And that goal is to obey your commanding officer. To the Corinthians are running after all kinds of things. They wanted Paul's ministry to look like this or like that. And he's saying, I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. I will be judged, but understand, I'm not here to please you or myself. It's this really interesting juxtaposition. And it's a good warning and a caution for us, especially in an age and a context where we live in a culture where the supreme value is authenticity. Right? The most kind and loving, most important thing you can do is be true to yourself. Right? You go and live your truth. I'll live mine and we'll all live happily ever after. And it makes its way even subtly into the church where you have people going, you've got to feel good about who you are and what you're doing and how you're following Jesus. Paul's sitting here saying, authenticity to myself is not my highest goal. The highest good is pleasing the one who entrusted me with this stewardship. He recognizes that his ministry as a servant is a stewardship from God. And it is supposed to be for the good of the Corinthians. 
So the implication for the Corinthians is that they shouldn't stand in judgment over the way Paul goes about his ministry. He's not there to please them. But he doubles down and he says, verse 5, Therefore don't pronounce judgment before the time of the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from the Lord. And really, this is a word of both instruction and a warning to the Corinthians. Let God be the judge. God's the one who will assess whether Paul's being faithful, along with any other minister, Apollos, Peter. Also be aware that God's going to do it better than you and I are, because he will judge perfectly and justly. It's really easy for us, right, to feel like we're able to judge the purposes of another's heart. It's easy for us to think that we can take a look at the, the scope of things and know what's going on behind the background or the experience of that person and, and almost put a judgment on it. And we'll find out next chapter um, that we are called to assess some things, especially when people call themselves believers. We're called to call them to repentance and call them to living for Christ. But that's not what's in view here. Paul's saying, I have the stewardship from God. I have to please God. But by extension, he's also saying, you have a stewardship from the Lord. So the question should be asked of the Corinthians, just like it should be asked of us. Are you pleasing him? Are you set on pleasing him? Are you stewarding what God has given you well? Are you living? Are you parenting? Are you leading ministries? Are you discipling in a way that's consistent with the gospel and consistent with what you've been given? Are you leading your families this way? Are you working this out in your occupation? So we see the first feature of Paul's gospel-centered ministry is that it's composed of servants and stewards. It's composed of servants and stewards. The second feature here is that gospel ministry begets sacrifice and spectacle. Gospel ministry begets sacrifice and spectacle. It's a ministry of sacrifice, and its ministers are spectacles. Paul now turns to address, ultimately, the root of the problem for the Corinthians. Their main problem throughout this whole conflict of division, which is a huge symptom, is what? Pride, right? They thought really highly of themselves. They thought they brought an awful lot to the table that God is lucky to have them on their team, and if they can just be let loose... They can really make some things happen, right? And we're all guilty of this in one way or another. But it's that pride that got them into this mess, acquiring for themselves leaders who would make them feel special. And Paul's saying you're finding too much value and pride in your own self. You see it in verse 6, he says they're puffed up. In verse 7, he says that they're boasting. And those things go in direct contradiction to what Paul's saying throughout the rest of the book. If you flip back, you can just see in chapter 1, verse 29, he says, God chose to save those who are weak in the eyes of the world so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Isn't that crazy? The, the gospel itself, the very nature of it, is designed so that you and I cannot boast. So these Christians, they get the gospel, they form the church, and immediately start boasting. You see it again in chapter, uh, verse 31 of chapter 1. He's quoting Jeremiah 9. He says, let the one who boasts not boast in himself, but boast in the Lord. And then chapter 3, verse 21, he goes directly at the heart. Let no one boast in men. Don't boast in yourself. Don't boast in your leaders. Those things are out of step with the gospel. They're contrary to its very design. And you get back to chapter 4, where we hear in verse 6, he says, I've applied all these things to myself and to Apollos for your benefit. Brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. The things he's talking about here in verse 6 are the things he's been applying to Apollos and to himself. It's basically everything he's been talking about from chapters 1 through 3. When he's talking about faithfulness to God, faithfulness to the gospel, he's talking about what faithful ministry looks like. He's applying it to his particular ministry context so that you can see Paul's not boasting. Apollos isn't boasting. They're trying to be an example so that the Corinthians can learn instead not to boast. And it's interesting, right? Like 
the very idea of boasting in general, sometimes we don't even know we're doing it, but boasting in general, it creates this dissonance in their hearts. He wants them not to be puffed up because it's a cancer of their heart when it comes to understanding and believing and living out the gospel. And then you see in verse 7, he says, for, he who see, or, sorry, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So Paul shows them how the gospel shapes the way we go about preaching and living. And yet they still want to insist that somehow they bring something to the table. So he gets really sarcastic with him. And he starts saying, what do you have that you did not receive? Right? Honestly, name one thing in your life, Corinthians, that you didn't ultimately receive as a gift from God. Who, in fact, owns all things, right? As we ended chapter 3. All things are yours in Christ. Why do you boast as if you didn't receive these things? So he's challenging them. They're far more dependent than they realized. And yet they're far more blessed than they realize in Christ. Because they came to Christ, really ultimately to God, with nothing. And yet they're boasting as if God needs them. The reality is, brothers and sisters, that the logic of the kingdom of God, of the gospel, it cuts against our self-sufficiency, of our own abilities. It's supposed to humble us. So he goes on through verses 8 through 13. We're not going to spend a lot of time picking it all apart, but what Paul wants to show them here with a really healthy dose of sarcasm, again, he's got this little verbal thing going on. He wants to show them it's supposed to bite a little bit. Already you have all that you want. Already you've become rich. Without us, you would have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. It stings in some ways because it's not true in the way they want it to be. They're not ruling. But it's true in the real sense that in Christ, they have everything that they need. And that's where chapter 3 ends. You've got all that you need and you're sitting here trying to boast as if you brought all the value. And he goes on and says, God exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. He illustrates that contrast between the gospel and it leads Paul to do this apostleship in a way that looks really starkly different from how the Corinthians seem to be living their life. The consistent theme in Paul's ministry is that he's being poured out for the sake of the good of others. But the Corinthians are taking that and they're thinking just because they're beneficiaries of Paul's ministry, they're pretty awesome. They're pretty awesome people. It's like this profound instance of just totally and completely missing the point, right? Like he just tries to go over and over again, over and over again, and eventually has to kind of use some harsh language to go, you've, you've completely missed the point. True gospel ministry begets sacrifice, and spectacle. In verse 9, you see, all apostles are least of all, like men sentenced to death, a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. And to men. The Corinthians are benefiting from Paul's ministry, right? his suffering, his being made a spectacle for their sakes. So Paul calls himself the scum of the world. And ultimately, this is what the gospel does to us, or should do to our hearts. Paul says gospel ministers are doing this for their good. Paul's ministry is one where he's being poured out. And in the way he's describing this, right, he's saying, I'm a fool, you're wise, we're weak, you are strong, you're held in honor, but we're in disrepute. It has echoes of even Jesus' work for us on behalf of us. It's almost like he's echoing those passages in Isaiah where you see this suffering servant motif, where this servant would suffer for their sakes, that Jesus would go to the cross for your benefit. He's the one who would be brought low so that instead you could be raised up. Paul's ministry, again, seems to be modeled to look an awful lot like that. So the implication here is, don't get puffed up. Don't imagine yourself to be something when Paul says, even Paul says, I'm nothing. Gospel ministry should bring us low. It's humbling. It's dependent on Christ, not on us. It's pouring ourselves out for others. 
So gospel ministry is composed of servants and stewards. Gospel ministry begets sacrifice and spectacle. And third, gospel ministry produces spiritual fathers and spirit-filled children. Gospel ministry produces spiritual fathers and spirit-filled children. Consider Paul's ministry toward the Corinthians, right? Yes, he's frustrated with them. He's annoyed that they're losing sight of the gospel. But he doesn't also lose sight of the fact that he loves them deeply. Look at verse 14. I don't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became a father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them in every church. Right? For Paul, this is not merely a transaction. It's not a transactional relationship because ministry is not an exchange of goods and services. Paul says, you have many guides, but I've been with you like a father. I've loved you like a father with his children. So Paul's not willing to say just like, goodbye, good luck. I'm just done with you already. Like, you guys are just so hopeless. He doesn't do that. He loves them like a father with his children. He's willing to chase after them. That's why he sends Timothy, in fact, another beloved child of his in the faith. And he says, I love you so much, I'm willing to send one of my best guys to come around and remind you not of how great Paul is, but the greatness of the gospel and the glory of Christ. And because he loves them, he feels the responsibility to correct them, right? Right? He knows that even though he loves his children in the faith, his responsibility is not to just say, guys, do whatever you want. But because he's, he's jealous to guard their progress in the faith. He cares for them. He's actually burdened by them. And he knows he has a responsibility not to just affirm everything. And there are some specific opponents in the Corinthians' midst who are disparaging Paul in some kind of way. They're pointing out how unimpressive Paul is. He says, Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon. And if the Lord wills, I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. I love this verse because it grabs our attention a little bit. It's kind of like Paul like, like, like gloving up, right? Or like, like rolling back the sleeves and be like, all right, like I'm coming, right? And like you think meek, lowly, tiny little Paul like with the like weepy eye or the, the sort of some kind of infirmity. And yet Paul's, like, he's got no issue with, like, all right, like, let's get to this. I'm coming. And when I come, I'm coming in power. And it's not my tiny little frame. It's the power of the gospel. And we'll see who's who. Right? Remember what these leaders have done. They've sacrificed the gospel for their own promotion. So Paul says, all they've got is talk. I'm coming in the power of the gospel. The gospel I'm going to bring that's going to be put on display for you does not consist of talk, but of power. And verse 21 is a little bit of pleading with them. This is what you want? Should I come to you with a rod or a, spiritual, or a spirit of gentleness? The implication for Paul is he's ready to correct. He's ready to act in fatherly ways towards them. The reality is, brothers and sisters, we all need this on some level. Right? We can look at the Corinthians and be like, I can't believe the Corinthians forgot the power of God and salvation. Like, how dare they? What idiots. Right? It's easy to believe. Just like everybody, everybody wants to like, get upset at the Israelites. Like, but God showed up in a fire cloud and a smoke cloud. Like, grumble, 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 grumble. But God did this incredible thing with Amanda. Grumble, grumble, grumble. But God gave like literal quail. Grumble, 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 grumble. You're like stupid Israelites. Sure, absolutely. Did you wake up this morning with breath in your lungs? Did you wake up with some kind of a roof over your head? You woke up with provision from the Lord, just like the Israelites did. And yet day after day, we forget how good God is to us. Like the Corinthians, right? I can't believe they failed to understand, to, to apply the implications of the gospel to this part of their lives. How dare they? There's almost a little bit of a verbal from Paul to us too, right? 
the reality is when we all sin, we do the exact same thing. It's a failure to trust in the simple message of the gospel. So when we become bitter at somebody because we think they're not paying enough attention to us or not celebrating this awesome thing that we did or how amazing we are or all the incredible work that we're putting in or that really clever thing that I said, when we act in those ways, we're forgetting the power of the gospel in our own heart. When we chase after success and the comforts of life in a way that tries to rescue ourselves, we're replacing the gospel that says in Christ, who is and who has given you everything that you need, it's instead saying, like, right, not everything. Like, I mean, Christ is amazing. He's given me a lot, but he hasn't given me everything. He doesn't have everything I need. He hasn't given me everything pertaining to life and godliness. Just most things. And when we do that in any tiny little minuscule way, we are turning from the simplicity of the gospel, brothers and sisters. So what grace it is then that the Corinthians had a father in the faith who was willing to correct them. Who was able to come and say, I want to realign you to this message. This is the work of faithful servants and stewards. They're not there to promote themselves. That's not what Paul does. These false leaders are saying, Paul is nothing. And Paul's going to say, I'm going to call you back to the gospel. I'm going to call you back to Christ. And I'm going to show you where this power of God actually comes from. So at Hilltown Baptist Church, may we be a church. May we be a people that are striving to apply and live out the gospel in all these areas of life. That ought to be our regular narrative as Christians, to constantly be aligning ourselves with the gospel and with the kingdom of God. What we get to do is have the privilege of reaching into one another's lives, right? This community of faith, this family of faith, to do that together. We get to remind each other how great Jesus is, how worthy Christ alone is of our worship. Because true gospel ministry is comprised of servants and stewards. These faithful ministers pour themselves out in sacrifice. They become a spectacle in the name of Christ. And true gospel ministry produces spiritual fathers and spirit-filled children. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the blessing of having and receiving and sitting under faithful leadership in your church, Lord. Lord, for giving us the work of the ministry for one another. And I pray that that these features that marked Paul's ministry would also mark our ministry here. God, that we would be so convinced of the truth of your gospel that our entire ministry towards one another and towards the lost is a proclamation and a reflection of how good you've been to us and how in Christ we have everything we need. We pray that we'll be able to do this with joy, knowing that we don't need to defend ourselves and we don't need to puff ourselves up, but in fact, we have everything that we need in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.